Hi everyone, I'm Rupal Hollenbeck and I'm the president of Checkpoint Software Technologies. At Checkpoint, we are passionate about securing the world and keeping everyone safe as they live, they work, and they play. I'm joined today by two of my colleagues, Dr. Dorit Dorr, who is our Chief Technology Officer, and Natalie Kramer, our newest executive team member at Checkpoint and our Chief Product Officer. Welcome to Checkpoint, and thanks to both of you for Welcome. being here. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> so today is International Women's Day. Happy International Women's Day, first and foremost. We're here together to celebrate with all of you. This year, the theme is embracing equity. And as you may know, Equity is about providing everyone with the resources that they need to have equal footing and to be successful. Or, to say it a different way, and to take it down to a pair of shoes, equality is giving everyone a pair of shoes. And if we wanted to be equal, we'd give them the same pair of shoes. But equity is something different. Equity is about giving everyone a pair of shoes that is uniquely appropriate to them so that they're as comfortable as possible. So that's the difference between equity and equality as we see it. So at Checkpoint, I'm particularly proud of the fact that half of our executive leaders are women. Three of us are here today. Um, unfortunately, this is not the norm in the global cybersecurity business, nor in the larger technology sector. And while I'm proud, we're proud of the progress that we've made, we still have a lot of work to do. On that point, I want to take a, a little bit of a step back in time. So Dorit, um, you started in the cybersecurity industry and with Checkpoint over 27 years ago. Yeah, when I was two years old. Yeah, she was two. Let's all remember <laughs> that. Um, but, um, but when you started, um, the cybersecurity industry and the larger tech industry was really different. What was it like? from a gender perspective? So let's start from before the two years old. I studied one of the interesting things, I think that at that time, the ratio of men and women in the university in computer science was not that different. I think we were close to 50-50 even. That's unique, that's that very was unique. quite unique. It doesn't necessarily translate that all these women went to work later in kind of what became the high-tech industry or in cyber industry. Uh, there were many reasons not to continue after, but at the beginning was quite a similar baseline back then. And uh, it was interesting for me uh, that I didn't feel a very big difference. I think the whole industry was much smaller. And those people that went to study math and computer science like I did, were very passionate about that. So they were, to begin with, they were kind of uh, going with their passion to work in something they wanted to learn. Right. And so it was, it was less uh, a, a generic thinking, what should I do? I should do this, I should do that. That was more of a, maybe a targeted audience that went to study these topics right. at that time. Right, and so you started a Checkpoint 27 years ago and there were maybe some women mm -hmm. around you at Checkpoint. What was that like? What was the environment like? And, and, and did you think about that? Yeah, so I was quite heads down when yeah. I joined Checkpoint. We were, uh, uh, I came to uh, manage the r and I didn't have uh, prior experience much uh, outside of the army that uh, did something very different. And so I was trying to figure out what my job is and how to win this cyber yeah. industry alongside with Checkpoint. And I was quite busy with that, I must say. I, there were quite a few women around. One of them, by the way, was a, a professor in the university. She taught me something in my first degree before I joined Checkpoint. Wow. She was with me uh, yeah. at Checkpoint. But, um, so there were a collection of different people, but uh, I didn't feel the need or urge to just being uh, in, in communication about women or men or gender. I was just trying to figure out what should I do and how to how to make it work for everybody. Yeah, yeah. So you weren't you weren't really distracted by it. You were heads down. You were focused. Yeah. And plus my previous uh, places also, I was one of the only women in, right. in specific places, such right. as the army and high school. So it, it was not a, a strange feeling at all. And it was not a reason to do or not to do anything. Okay. Okay. That's great. Um, 
Natalie, you've got broad and diverse experience in tech that's been outside of cyber. Give us your perspective on how you've seen the industry since the time you began in it and where you see yourself today. So definitely there is lots of improvement. You know, just if, even if I measure it by the, how many times I go to a meeting and I'm the only woman in the room, right? right. It's less and less. Uh, but we still have a long way to go, right? If you look at the numbers in the tech industry, 33% women, and the sad thing is it's flat for a while now. Right? Yeah. And whatever we do, we don't manage to break that. And, you know, there is an interesting study that I like to quote about um, large U.S. companies and how many CEOs they have named John versus how many women, right? And there are more men named John John as CEOs of large US companies than women's all women together, <laughs> together uh, as CEO. Yeah. And just today I, I looked at that again and I saw that there are even more Davids, right? So it's quite unbelievable. We have a long way to go to get to this. But, but I think that uh, the, there are multiple angles here. There mm -hmm. is the angle of selecting STEM and there is the angle of selecting leadership. And I think uh, in some senses, some of the CEOs are a, a, co a combination of both STEM and leadership in some senses. Yeah. But uh, each part has its own challenges. So not enough women in STEM, not enough women in, leader in leadership, and not enough women in STEM and leadership. Altogether. That's right. That intersection, that intersection is really, really small. It's one of the reasons yeah. we're really proud to be working with the two of you. Um, but but it is unbelievable yeah. because I agree with Dorit, the fact that there is so low percentage of women going to STEM, forget about leadership for a minute, I still can't get it. I, I've read a lot, I've studied a lot, it's still low and doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, right. yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I, you know, funny enough, my, my daughter, who's now 17, she came to me in the first grade um, and she's a great math student and she came to me in the first grade and she said, well, mommy, today at school I learned that girls aren't good at math. You can imagine wow. my reaction. <laughs> this is first grade. So I think it really, I mean, it starts young. Now she's a, an algebra tutor, but cool. But still in first grade to have your child come home and say, girls aren't good at math. Sure. That's what I learned today. It's, um, it's, you should it's have really called Dorit and let her meet her. And exactly. Her girls are great in math. Exactly. <laughs> it worked out yeah. in the end. My favorite class in high school was calculus. She thinks I'm crazy, <laughs> but, um, but, but to that point on progress, you know, if we, if, we, if we sort of try to build perfection, we'll never have progress. And if we settle for our progress as the best we can do, we won't get further. And so I think your point, Natalie, on powering through the stagnation is really, really important. The fact that things have been stagnant for a few years should be really worrying for us. Yeah. And the question is, how do we power through that? Um, and so, you know, for sure. And I think, by the way, some yeah. of it is your, your profession, like, I think we miss on the marketing of this, you know, <laughs> industry somehow. Yeah. So it has the position of uh, people in hoodies sitting in the basement and drinking <laughs> coke. I do have a hoodie, <laughs> but, um, but you're absolutely right. Um, you know, stereotypes and typecasting, it's all, it's all part of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's all absolutely part of it. So, so on that point, so Natalie said, how do we, you know, we've had the stagnation. And I talked about needing to, to power through the stagnation. Mm -hmm. This is about the road, um, the road for others, for, for us, the road for mm -hmm. the next generation. And how, you know, what are, what are the words of wisdom? What are the things we know for sure? What are the things that we wish that we could have told our younger selves? And so, um, so I'll start with you, Natalie, this time. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on, you know, what would you tell your younger self? <laughs> To dare, I think, right? Yeah. To dare to challenge the environment, not to take things you're said for, you know, as this is the rule and I have to apply to that, challenge the environment, challenge people around you, uh, believe in yourself. I think that's the most important thing we could tell, you know, young women, that's what I tell my daughter. Yeah, yeah, believe in yourself and dare on multiple levels, dare. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, um, you know, it's like dare to, take credit like if you think about women in an interview many people many you see many times that they don't take credit for what they did it's always we did it and they always keep it really small 
um, in, you know, talking about studies, there is a study about, you know, um, a, a woman as a candidate for a job looking at the requirements and there are 10 requirements and she's looking at the 10th one and saying, oh, I don't have that or maybe I'm ha I have half of that so I will not apply while a man will look at the 10 requirements. He has half of the first one and say, I'm the best man Let's for the go. job. Let's go. <laughs> Uh, and it's just yeah. a lost opportunity, right? Yeah, yeah, and 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 you attribute that to both daring and and confidence. Yeah, and that and that confidence because we, all three of us know that part of taking on a new role in this industry is not just about being great at something, but about learning something too, and about growing. Um, and so having the confidence to say, yeah, there's some things exactly. here that I've done, and there's some things here that I that I haven't done. That's actually what makes it a great fit because it's an opportunity to grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, what advice do you have, Dorit? Uh, so I, I, I continue along the same lines with a bit of a variant. I think in some senses, women care too much about what being said or what's around them. Are there enough women? Are there enough uh, uh, friends? Uh, what would their friends say? And all kind of arguments. Um, men care typically less about that and they just go with what they love and believe and want to do. And I think we should trash, uh, trust our passions more. If you know what you like and you, you want to try it, just try it. Don't ask that much around you. Is it good for you? Is it not good for you? Just try it for a while and then you could always change. We're changing things all the time. We're changing positions. We're, uh, we're learning new things. You could always move around to a different thing after you tried it for a while. So I think we should move with our instincts more and mm. we should uh, move with our passion and what we are very good at without so much, you know, let's say, analyzing it. We are yeah. overanalyzing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a tendency to do that sometimes. I think what I often tell young leaders, new leaders, is um, to always have a career plan but use pencil, not pen. This isn't about <laughs> yeah. setting it firm and, and feeling like you can't change. And I, so I love this sort of dare to experiment notion and, and follow your passion because that's how we actually learn what we like and what we don't like and what we're good at and what we're not good at is we try new things. And so I, I like to think about it as writing your career plan in pencil. You're always open to the possibility. Yeah. I think this also brings a difference from the past history to these days, mm -hmm. because I think uh, an older generation used to think about your one place of work mm. as your one place of work. You selected one role, you selected the place of work, you would stay there. Yeah. 27 years. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I selected it, by the way, I, I selected it because I love it. But other than that, most people did choose their career in a, in a fixed way. And, and uh, these days, it's, it's completely in the norm to change, to try one thing, to move to another. It's, it's not weird at all. Yeah. In fact, it's expected. Yes. Yeah. So, so use it, you know, try it, try something, try something else. Uh, be a leader, then take a personal, you know, role, then, then try a different like segment or yeah. something. Yeah. So use this. It's, it's a great opportunity actually to, mm -hmm. to find out and to tune what you really love to do more. For sure. For sure. You know, I'd probably add a few um, pieces of advice to what you both said, plus one to both of you. Um, but on top of that, I think that um, something that occurs to me is um, um, our belief system and our confidence. Um, lots of research shows confidence levels in women as they rise through the ranks of leadership actually goes down um, compared to confidence in men has a tendency to go up. and. You know, what do we do in those instances? How do we help the women around us build their confidence and their belief system and their own capabilities? And I've, I've learned something myself in my career, which is um, there, there are often times of uncertainty and doubt and I question myself. Um, but there are people around me that have actually suggested my promotion or suggested my trying something new. And, um, and I can remember saying, well, gee, does that person know that I can't tick all the boxes? that I don't have three or four of that list of 10 things. But it came down to me ultimately trusting people that trusted me and believing in the people that believed in me. Because I have one lens on myself. 
Um, you have one lens on yourself, but I see you differently. I see you in a different way. It's a different lens. And same with you, Natalie. And so I've learned to catapult myself and take risk that I normally wouldn't have taken because I, I ultimately said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe in the person who believes in me and I'm going to give it a go. And that's helped me get out of my comfort zone a lot. And so that's kind of a piece of advice um, that I offer um, women early in their careers as a way to build their own confidence and feel good about taking smart risk. Uh, sometimes you could also, by the way, uh, we sometimes think about mentorship only as a like, side thing or a upper level thing, but you could also try to do mentoring with uh, younger people, people around you. You could, you could ask somebody, I did it once uh, for a session and to seek feedback from somebody yes. who's side to you, um, as long as there is openness for the discussion. Um, and you could, you could learn a lot of things yeah. about yourself in a, in a very different angle than yeah. what you... I, I believe in the peer feedback and, and peer mentoring very, very much. Um, I've been at Checkpoint for a year now, and I honestly consider Dorit to be one of my mentors. Um, not because there not was a, a good mentor. <laughs> <laughs> not because there was a specific thing that I was trying to get better at, but I was in a new environment. I've been in a new environment, and having just crossed the one year mark, turning to my colleagues within my organization and across my colleagues like like Dorit and myself, I think that 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 peer coaching, that peer mentorship is a really, really important way for you to get feedback and see yourself the way that others see you. And um, yeah, it's been a really, um, um, it's been a really powerful thing. I want to also um, touch on this notion of the unconventional career path. So I'm a finance person. I actually have my undergraduate degree in finance. I got an MBA. Um, I speak a few languages. Um, none of, besides English, none of which I really use right now, but I had this sort of diverse and very different background, you know, and here I, here I sit in cybersecurity and I spent the majority of my career in, in semiconductors. And so let's talk a little bit about this unconventional career path and sort of what you thought you were going to do when you started your career and, and maybe some of the zigs and zags and changes that have happened in either growth within a company or movement among companies and what that's taught you about the importance of not being so focused on one path. I think you really get a lot of courage from doing the first move and then the second move is much easier and the third mm -hmm. move, I remember as an example, I walked, you know, the beginning of my walk in AT&T, I came from a background of embedded and mobile applications. I was on maternity leave. Uh, after you know, um, working on mobile application, and they called me and asked me to walk, to move to a whole different area of enterprises, and I was like, "Are you sure? You know that I've never done that." And I remember the first moment going to the room, knowing that everyone knows more than me about that, and I need to tell them what to do, and how frightening that was. And then the second time it happened, it was much easier. And the second time after that, it was easier every time because I knew that I was able to provide value after time, yeah. right? So you take this courage, you take these moments, you take the good memories and take them with you as you move to the next one. I have two uh, comments. One, I'm very diverse in my career, as you <laughs> notice. <laughs> so maybe not in company, but I would argue very diverse in uh, career. And, uh, <laughs> so uh, before I joined the army, many uh, kids in my class went to seek what you could study in the university before the army, so you could serve in the profession. So I, I went to the university. I bought a book back then. You'd see the book of courses of like tracks that you could take mm -hmm. to university. I got to the page math and computer science. I thought, wow, somebody really asked what <laughs> I would ever want to do in my <laughs> life. Put it all together and that was the decision. There it was. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my uh, diverse selection of role. But uh, putting that aside, yeah. um, I did change roles inside Checkpoint uh, in the sense that I, I moved to product management. I did some m and I did different things. And um, in some of them, I uh, realized an opportunity. I stood up and I said, okay, how about me taking it this time or something like that? I offered myself to 
um, to take a bit of different path that was really unconventional for me. I, for a while, I was managing the consumer business, which I really had nothing, you know, absolutely no knowledge about. But it was interesting. So there was an opportunity. I said, okay, let's let's try this for half a year and let's see what's going on. So um, it, it was an add-on to my job, but it was an interesting experience and learn. Yeah, yeah. So the unconventional career path and, and diversity in our careers can take different shapes. It can take us to different companies. It can take us to different functions and departments within a company. And ultimately, we grow as a result. I think from our experiences, we're telling you that um, embracing that unconventional thinking and career path is, um, is important and can be really important in your career. Um, Plus, I it's fun. Plus, it's fun. It's, it's absolutely fun. I can honestly say that my last year has been super fun. Um, so I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the things that we all do and believe and understand about supporting women in technology. Um, so Doreen, I know you're um, very involved in organizations that do this both at the university level and through other organizations, including um, She Codes. Um, so what do you think we can do to build this culture of equity um, at Checkpoint and also in the larger cybersecurity industry? So I'll start at checkpoint and I'll move to the to the bigger picture. So yeah. uh, after you know being heads down and like passing the first few years, when I realized that there is a challenge, and, yeah. and I started to look around to think what could help, I I offered some uh, of the women around me to just do a brainstorm, and we just met and thought what would work for them. At the end. I thought that a combination of mentoring and networking would work very well. And since then, we have a program that twice a year uh, we joined up uh, mentors and mentorees uh, from kind of a similar background or interest. And we take uh, two, three months together uh, for two people to work together and kind of think through challenges. And then it, it's over to the next program. But while doing this, we also do networking session and we bring some lectures and I found out that this opens up a lot of relations in the organization that could then survive post the mentoring program. Right, right. And it so leaves a legacy. And it also yeah. brings idea because then we would ask them, you know, how could we bring more recruits yeah. more women recruits? What would help you come as a, as a recruit yeah. uh, to checkpoint? So we, we improve yeah. that. So this is a way to, to create a dialogue and to start doing different programs. And I think the most important thing outside of, of Checkpoint is, is a, in a wider sense is to bring more women to STEM and to high tech. This is such a great career for women that we are completely missing out on it. And we need the pipe. Uh, we need more women starting, starting this as a career, giving it the chance and trying this over so that we will have the chance to have like 50-50 after yeah, yeah. And let's let's do 70-30 even. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Why not? It's been the other way for a long time. <laughs> um, so, Natalie, you've, um, you're taking over a large organization across product management and across R&D. How do you think about building a culture of equity in your organization? And how do you think um, that can play and, and what can we learn from that across the broader industry? So, starting with my own organization, the honest truth is there is no one silver bullet. There mm -hmm. isn't one thing we can do and we'll solve the problem or we would have long time ago. Mm -hmm. I think it should start with the interview process. No, even before that, we talked about defining um, you know, a position. How do you define the language you use defining a position? Uh, not saying things are mandatory when they're not mandatory, going back to what we said earlier. Then look at interviews. Yeah. I, I found that having at least one woman in the interview process really helps promote women because all through my years, uh, I remember when I interviewed a woman, she felt more comfortable asking me, how do I manage as a manager and a mom? And I could tell her how I balanced and we could have an open discussion about that and she could feel better coming to work in the company I work for because if I managed to grow and be promoted uh, with three kids, and find the right balance, she can do it also. So having That's a way right. in the interview process, super important. And then how do you grow women? Mentorship program, like Dorit said, is, is a great opportunity. 
Um, and I think all of us as managers, and now I'm just, it's not just gender diversity, but diversity as overall, needs to work harder to find um, even small talk discussions with people that are different than us, right? It's very easy for people to have um, this bond with people that came from the, right, the same background, the same gender, the same you know, thoughts, beliefs, all of that culture. But we need to work a bit harder with our employees that are a bit different from us to create that bond. But it's important because once we create that bond, then we have a trust, then we can build things together. So I think we need to work extra hard on that. And that is an employer, right? If we're talking over the overall industry, diversity in general is something that I'm really passionate about. It's actually my night job for years where, you know, I'm leading a group in, in the Israeli industry where we are a um, group of executives working on diversity in Israel in the high-tech industry. And I think we have a long way to go as an industry. And I think the first step for that is to share success stories between companies. This is what we do. This is, you know, this is the program for women we have in the company. It's not a competition because we all want to have more women. Let's share what we do and let's copy from each other. Um, I think it's also going to, you know, work in with different um, nonprofit organizations to make sure that the programs they have to bring us diverse candidates are optimized to what we as the business team needs. I think overall diversity is not just something you do, you know, you know, we haven't talked about it. Why do you need diversity even, right? It's not just because it's the right thing and moral thing to do. Of course, that's the moral thing to do. It's also better for the business. Exactly. Um, and we need to tell that story and give everyone motivation on why, why do we even bother? Right. Yeah, and the and the data absolutely supports that. It's not just good; it's good for business. Yeah, exactly. And and that's so so important. I'm glad you brought that up. And I would the only thing that I would add, and um, not because my daughter brought this up in first grade, <laughs> but it starts young. Yeah, it actually starts young. Um, and you brought up the inter the the great point of if you can see it, you can be it. And so having a woman in the interview process is great. I happen to co co teach a class at university um, called Women in Leadership. Um, um, both at the undergraduate and the graduate level, but I think it starts so much earlier than that. And so um, I, think it's, I think that's really, really important. Um, as, we, as we look to, um, to wrap up um, this afternoon, I, I want to ask each of you about your own view um, of equity. And if you took anything from our conversation or something that you've been thinking about with International Women's Day, What's an action that you think you're going to take coming out of our conversation and that you would advise others take? A, a really meaningful, concrete action at creating equity. Um, what, would, what would that be? Well, I think uh, the, the example of the shoes works for me. Um, I didn't think about this example so clear, clearly before our discussion. And so I'm going to think better what what fits everyone. So I'm trying to think about it, I think, for a while, but I'd, it wasn't that clear to me, the distinction. So this is something. That's great. Yeah, that's a great one. Sort of dialing up the contrast between equality and equity, um, both being important. Mm -hmm. How about you, Natalie? I will take Dorita's advice not to think about what people think. That's a great one. That's a great one. I think um, for me, um, even though some might consider that some of my career path has been daring. Um, I think that's actually really inspiring what you said, Natalie, which is, you know, dare to believe in yourself and dare um, to take that risk. Um, I think the chance of success is far greater than anything else when we believe in ourselves. And so I think that dare to believe um, and dare to take that, um, take that risk is, is really important. Um, ultimately, our job as leaders is to help our teams grow and deliver um, and so that we can be prosperous not only in our jobs but so that people can be professionally and personally prosperous and I think the role of leadership is to bring an organization together so that you can help them achieve things that you really never thought possible and um, that sort of is the goosebump moment for me when it comes to when it comes to leadership and so um, with that 
I want to thank my guests, thank Dorit you. and Natalie. Thank you for being here with me. It's been wonderful to share these thoughts with you this afternoon. And with that, I think we're ready to close. But you know, the theme is embracing equity. I think we ought to embrace ourselves yeah. and embrace <laughs> equity. So thank you for being with us. Have thank a great for, day. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you.